This is the second lecture, second full lecture on China. And we're talking about the Neolithic and early dynasties. So what Neolithic means is literally new stone age. Um, but what historians are talking about when they say Neolithic is the advent of agriculture. Uh, so once a people starts uh, practicing full-time agriculture, meaning they're not hunting and gathering anymore, uh, then we call them Neolithic. So this is in different times and different parts of the world, um, even within uh, places in China. So for this period, we're talking about about 7,000 to 2250 BC. And then we'll talk about some of the following dynasties and not in a lot of detail, the most ancient ones, but we'll try to get the points that we need to be able to understand the rest of it. Um, so with this section with ancient dynasties, we'll wrap up with Qin dynasty. Uh, which is the first one that's kind of a united China um, or close to what you think of when you think of, of China today. Uh, still much smaller, but getting closer. So for this lecture, it'll just be Neolithic period. Uh, so there's a lot of different areas you could go to uh, in China to be able to do this. Uh, so we're just picking one of them. So in about 7,000 BCE, we see in this area on the map, uh, domesticated millet, rice and pigs. Uh, so I'm assuming you know what rice and pigs are, but you probably may not know uh, what millet is. In the United States, it's usually used in bird seed, and it's those small kind of yellow dots that they have in bird seed. And it's really good though. <laughs> you can eat it as a human um, and you can cook it so it's not like it is in bird seed. Uh, so those were the first domesticated um, animals and Rice was actually domesticated much later. Um, generally, cultures have to, well, always, cultures have to build up an agricultural society before they can start cultivating rice uh, because to cultivate rice requires to be settled for a while and, and um, irrigation and a lot of other things that um, it's not something that you would start with, basically. So we're talking about Southeast China around the Yellow River, so named because of the yellowish silt uh, along its banks. And the culture we're going to talk about, again, we could choose a bunch of different ones, is the Liangzhu culture. Uh, so for, from about 3400 to 2250 BC. So we're going to get towards uh, the dynastic eras, towards the end of this. And most of what's found, and part of this is because these are the things that last, but also these things were intended to last, are ceramics and jade card vessels. Uh, so two of the forms, the people at this time did not write. So uh, the names that we have for these forms are later Chinese people. And I'll tell you about the meanings that later Chinese people attach to them. And we can't be absolutely certain if these prehistoric um, Chinese people had attached those meanings. But the first one is a B, and that's a circular form, uh, usually with a hole in it, so kind of like a disc. And then the Kong, which is a rectangular form. And both of these forms were used by later Chinese people uh, especially the B, and had particular meanings. Uh, so they, I'll kind of talk about the, the complications with that as we go along. So first thing is a Kong, and it's made out of jade. Um, a lot of times when you see jade nowadays, it's a, a different kind of stone. Uh, you may be thinking of that kind of Kelly green type of translucent stone. Uh, and that type of jade comes from Southeast Asia, and it was used later on in China, and we'll see some examples. Uh, but this one, which was available in China, it's nephrite jade, and it's still used today. Uh, if you go to some of the Asian markets in the Detroit area, you can find some nephrite or some plastic made to look like nephrite. And it's an extremely hard stone. So that's to tell you something right away that this culture uh, was had to develop pretty sophisticated tools to be able to work this. So it's slicing and drilling and abrasives. Uh, and according to Sherman Lee, who wrote a great book about Asian art. Uh, it is far ahead of any other known Neolithic sculptural achievement. And what Lee is talking about is um, the precision uh, and the amount of kind of work that would go into before you start working. So the work that would go into the tools. And we'll see that some of the tools seem to have been standardized. Uh, so that also is what Lee was talking about when he's talking about it being far ahead of any sculptural achievements. 
And I'm guessing those of you who are looking at it now, you may see it as kind of like modernist or minimalist, uh, something along those lines. Uh, so it does have this, this feel that we look at because of its precision uh, and the architectonic shapes, meaning shapes that are like, um, that are simple shapes and squares like architecture. Uh, you may see that and see um, kind of modernist or even contemporary types of sculpture and design. So with this, it's very abstract. Uh, so uh, generally, these pieces that are shown on the corner are thought to be monsters. And if I show you another example, we can kind of get an idea of what that's like. Uh, so when we see this one from the corner, uh, jade can come in this color as well, nephrite jade. Uh, and sometimes it can change color over time. Um, this one, according to the art historian that was hired <laughs> by this, um, this kind of like antique auction place, said that it came from applying heat. So you get this kind of golden color from applying heat to it. Uh, and you can kind of see how there's these abstracted forms. Some people could see them as like ogre type forms. So a monstrous human, uh, perhaps a nose, eyes there, and a bridge of a nose here, a snout or something. And same thing here. We can see that these circles are standardized. So it uses some type of circular cutter, cutting tool uh, and that kind of shows you the sophistication that goes into these pieces. A lot of these uh, very abstract and you know, lots of simple lines we're gonna see develop into what you're gonna recognize as Chinese styles. So again, some of them are monsters. You can see, a, again, the corner's kind of cut off here, but you can get an idea of what they're going on with these kind of abstract forms. Uh, the iconography seems to form the basis of the Shang, and we do have some information about the Shang and what it means, uh, and I'll talk about what that is when we get there. But we, the meaning is really unknown, so we're not sure because of the resemblance of the iconography that the iconography has the same meaning. And if you're not familiar with the meaning of iconography, make sure you go up to that first in-class assignment lecture, which actually isn't an in-class assignment, but go to that and you'll see um, a description of these terms. So later Chinese people thought the cone shape was fascinating. So this one you can see it's from much, much later, uh, from more than 3,000 years later, uh, from about the 13th century. And it's made in ceramic, but they're going for this cone form. Uh, and that's what later Chinese scholars called it. Um, Watson looks at it and kind of like Lee is amazed by what he, he sees with the jades. He says it's lacking simpler antecedents and defying explanation as much in, in antiquity as today. So later Chinese people actually collected these jades and put them into their tombs. Uh, so sometimes you'll find something, it was put in a tomb and it was already a thousand years old. So the lack of antecedents may be due to a lack of architectural digging. Uh, and that's something that the current Chinese government has definitely been interested in working on to try to um, look at these ancient Chinese agricultural societies and see where this stuff came from. It can be difficult sometimes because if they don't use stone or ceramic, something that lasts uh, for a lot of their pieces, they're not going to last. Uh, so the antecedents could be made out of more ephemeral, meaning materials that don't last as long. So this is a bee. Um, and... Later Chinese saw the bee as protective, um, perhaps pr protective of the po, the part of the soul that stays in the body. And that may be the case with, with what the prehistoric people thought as well, because uh, a lot of these pieces were found, and this one you can see it's about the same size as, as, as a vinyl record. Um, and, you know, in a, a long playing record for music. <laughs> And the outside, you can see how the color has changed. Uh, and this is kind of gross, I guess you could say. Uh, but that color change seems to have come from contact with decaying bodies. Uh, so we'll see in later Chinese cultures that they believe jade could protect the Po. And they even made these incredibly complex uh, jade suits that we'll look at. Uh, so it may be that um, these prehistoric Chinese people had the same sort of meaning since they often covered the bodies uh, with these, and they even kind of linked them together with gold thread. They knew that gold wouldn't tarnish over time. 
So some of them seem to be ceremonial copies of actual weapons. Uh, normally in this class, I would say that jade would be a poor choice for weapons. Uh, and yes, for a sword like this, it would definitely be a, a poor choice. Uh, swords, they want them to be able to bend. Um, jade is very hard and I'm sure this, this edge is sharp, uh, but if you were to use it, uh, it could, it's brittle as well. So it could break very easily. But there are cultures like um, in Mesoamerica and South America, pre-Columbian, um, that had some jade type weapons, but those may have been ceremonial as well. So we're not exactly sure. So this one was in the shape of a jong blade. That's a name from later Chinese cultures. So hence, that's what we call it. Uh, and you can see again, the precision, it looks almost like it's modern or even industrially produced. Uh, so you can see why ancient and uh, modern people are kind of amazed by these items. Another one in the form of a sword. Oh man, the real sword. I definitely want that, want that used on me. And it does look like a very sharp edge here, but again, probably not the type of weapon you would want to use in real life. Uh, maybe these ceremonial weapons also had wrappings around hilts or other pieces that are missing now. Uh, we're not sure. The stone is what has lasted. So this last one towards the end of the period, you can see it's dated for late Neolithic to early Shang. Um, hopefully you can kind of see how a lot of these abstract designs of co kind of coalesced into these curves that you may recognize um, as being um, a Chinese style. Uh, so we're gonna see this sort of ogre type image a little bit later on, it's called Tao Tia, uh, the gluttonous ogre. And um, it's gonna be called that by later Chinese people. Um, so this is kind of amazing. We're see, seeing something that is about 4,000 years old, and we're going to see some continuity all the way to the present um, with people doing traditional arts. Uh, so that's an amazing span of time, almost an imaginal, unimaginable span of time um, for the longest continuous culture that we know of in the history of the world. And the last one I'm showing it to you because I think it's cute. <laughs> it says a head ornament, uh, but again, it has some of the styles. We see the abstraction from the earlier ones, but also some of these designs that are gonna become more popular um, as we go along. 